Hello, and welcome to our virtual annual discipline meeting for the 2023-2024 year. For those who may not know me, I'm Dan Lamont, the School Partnership Specialist for Penn Highlands Dual Enrollment Program. During our fall 2023 semester, we resumed our in-person ACE Discipline meetings at the Penn Highlands Richland campus. There, our college liaisons were able to hold live sessions with our ACE instructors to discuss specific topics related to the disciplines that you teach. While we understand that it is not always possible for teachers to attend the live meetings, these discussions were recorded so those absent can gain the benefit of the event. Please enjoy the recording of your annual discipline-specific activity, and we look forward to working with you in the fall and hope you can join us in the next ACE Discipline meeting. Thank you. Okay, so I apologize, but my um, web camera is not working at the moment, um, but that's okay because I'm going to be sharing my screen. So this is, I guess I should introduce myself. I am Jessica Peacock. I am an adjunct instructor here at Penn Highlands Community College, and I teach psychology and sociology. Um, some of you have um, talked to me before as the ACE liaison, and um, that's the role I'm in at this moment while reviewing some information for social sciences. So um, again, I apologize that you cannot see me since I am not able to share my screen, but what I want to do is um, just kind of review some of the current trends that we are seeing in the social sciences just to um, help us all you know, maintain that current mentality of what is happening in the fields of psychology and sociology. So what I want to review is just kind of a, a quick little review of some of the common pedagogy that is um, currently being emphasized and focused on when teaching psychology and sociology, but then really looking at the current trends in the field, in the fields of psychology and sociology, what is going on right now that's going to drive research, that's going to drive the way we teach. I have a few little resources to share, and uh, this is a recording of a previously, previously presented um, presentation. So when we did meet live, we had open discussion uh, to discuss some current strengths and needs and, and questions and support. So we will not be having that in this recording. Um, but please know that if you have any questions, you are always welcome to reach out to me um, or the community college, and we will support you the best way we can. So looking at the current psychology and sociology pedagogy, obviously these social sciences are so connected that often you're going to see that the suggestions for how we teach psychology and sociology are very similar. So I combined them for the sake of this presentation. But when we are practicing pedagogy, which is again, just the, the concepts and theories of, of how we should teach these topics, um, connection is one of the primary strategies in teaching psychology and sociology. And connection, obviously we wanna connect to our students, but it's really connecting the content that we are teaching to the students' own experiences, their interest, and their real world problems. If there's one thing we understand in psychology, it's that if you can create an emotional connection to something, you're going to understand it better and you're going to retain it better. So we teach that in Psych 100. So we wanna make sure that when we are teaching this content, that we are finding a way to connect the content to real world situations and real world problems to help them build that additional knowledge. There's a concept called social pedagogy, and social pedagogy is um, a little different than sociology, which we'll we'll talk about here at the bottom. But it's really a holistic and relationship-centered approach to um, teaching these social sciences. And the concept behind having a social pedagogy is really to foster that well-being, to foster the learning, and to encourage social change. So social pedagogy is really a mindset that recognizes and promotes individual potential and social responsibility, recognizing how what we are teaching, what the students are learning 
can really carry over into their social environment and can really have an impact on their relationships, on um, their future. Again, connecting it, you're really going back to the idea of connecting it to what is important to them in their experiences and in their real world and interests right now. So the third one on here is alignment. And this is just recognizing the importance of aligning the curriculum with prior knowledge and skills that they've created. So making sure that the, you know, the, the classes that we're teaching that are, um, you know, here at the community college, we are teaching beyond introduction to psychology and introduction to sociology. So we need to make sure that we're aligning those future classes, those 200 level courses, building on knowledge that was taught in the 100 level courses so that they have a foundation as they go into those higher courses. Um, I often tell people that, um, you know, I feel like a an associate's and bachelor's degree are the hardest degrees to acquire because they are trying to make you a well-rounded student. You're getting all the foundational information. You don't have all the experience yet to really connect and understand the material, but that once you go to a master's program and those programs are really fine-tuned into what you're interested in, you start to gain the concepts. You start to really understand them. Um, You start to be able to apply them practically. And then when you get to a doctoral program, it's even more fine-tuned. And so um, that alignment of of that content, when what you're learning in your master's and doctorate level really are built on what you gained in your bachelor's level. So I always try to explain that to students when they're when they're looking at moving forward in their education. Like what really is the difference? And I say, man, you know, the, the further you get, the more the classes you're taking are aligned with what your interests are, which I thought made it easier to complete because you're so interested in that content. Um, Going through here, community. When we are teaching psychology and sociology and social sciences, we want to build a community of learning. And that is, again, a mind frame, a pedagogy. This is how do we do this is we have cooperative learning activities. Um, We engage in group work. And this is getting more and more important as our culture is shifting to um, online learning or our culture is shifting to communicating behind a screen. You know, anything we can do to help, we kind of have to help a lot of our younger students, especially build some skills to do cooperative learning activities and to do group work because it's not um, a skill that they're naturally learning as they may have before uh, smartphones and before, you know, uh, online learning and, and online social interaction. Uh, One of my absolute favorites are um, the next two. And the first one here is interest, creating interest by allowing exploration of topics. One of the things I love the most about uh, the social sciences are the conversations that you have. Everything we teach connects to real life. And I think when we make that connection, you start to see the interest of the students really grow. So recognizing, you know, what are the trends for the students? What are the experiences? What are the hot topics in their life? And how can you connect the content to that to gain that interest and to explore those solutions or explore those topics a little bit further? So my absolute favorite is the solution-focused mindset. And this is, you know, anytime someone especially in sociology, when you're bringing up maybe some um, topics that can be taboo or that students are uncomfortable talking about, or they're maybe nervous to talk about with other students because they don't want to be judged or they, they're they afraid they're going to offend somebody. Um, if we can approach the social sciences with a solution-focused mindset, meaning that I don't have all of the answers but there's always a way to find a solution. If we have a mindset of brainstorming and problem solving any concern or barrier that someone has with the content, with learning, with um, attending our classes, everything is about, okay, what are the solutions? Here is the real world problem. What are the solutions to overcoming this real world problem? And that is a phenomenal mindset to help teach uh, the social sciences. Person-centered, especially when you're teaching psychology, we want to remember um, in those those chapters that we're really talking about your um, mental health um, 
diagnoses, those kind of things. We always want to remember that um, in these fields, we're really shifting to person-centered, meaning recognizing the person first and what they're experiencing second. So in the example of teaching the abnormal psychology course here at the community college or teaching the chapter on psychological disorders, you know, I want to, when I'm teaching that, when, if I'm being person-centered, instead of saying that someone um, is depressed, I'm going to say that there is a person who is experiencing symptoms associated with depression. They are a person first and they are experiencing symptoms. They're not a diagnosis first. So we're really trying to use language that recognizes um, an individual is the fact that they're a person, that they're a human, that they're an individual is first and foremost, but that they all have these other experiences that may be impacting them, but it doesn't define who they are. Trauma informed is massive. I really encourage, especially when teaching social sciences, I really encourage everyone to um, take some time and learn about trauma informed care or um, trauma. I'm trying to think of the other term is it's trauma informed or trauma sensitive. Uh, recognizing that the topics we teach in social psychology can really um, bring stress, traumatic stress responses, can bring some confusion, some discomfort to a lot of the students who maybe haven't recognized that the things that they've experienced or been through have been harmful or have been difficult or stress for them. So recognizing what some of our students have experienced and how to manage that and how to have those conversations is really, really important. So honestly, you can do, oh, we have so many resources that are available to learn about trauma-informed care in the educational setting. So I highly recommend taking some time to, to educate yourself on strategies for trauma-informed care in educational settings. And then lastly, psychology and sociology as pedagogy themselves. So the, the topics that we're teaching, the content that we're learning, actually using that as a mind frame to teach. It's not just information. It's not, it's not just information to be memorized uh, for a test, but it's actually a mind frame and a strategy for learning. And so taking these concepts and really putting them into your teaching style is an amazing way to um, really improve the way that we're teaching psychology and sociology. So down here, I actually have um, a link and I can't remember if that is supposed to be on here or if it's meant to be on the resource page, but um, both the American Psychological Association and the American Sociological Association have additional tools and resources for teachers teaching psychology and sociology. So I highly recommend jumping to their website. Some of the resources are free. Um, some of the extra tools are free. Some of them, there's a membership that you can pay to get additional you know, information. But again, just a really good resource if you've never jumped over there before. So looking at the current um, or emerging trends in the field of psychology, this field is growing exponentially. And there's a few different reasons for that. Um, we are, thank goodness, after decades of, of hard work, we are reducing the stigma of psychological disorders and also improving the acknowledgement of psychology as a true science. So um, that is, those are two of the reasons that we're ex experiencing such growth. And one of the things that, you know, um, current and, and young research is showing is that the COVID-19 pandemic really helped us reduce the stigma of mental health because people who had never struggled before were struggling and recognizing um, that there are times where it's hard to manage your thoughts, your emotions, your behaviors. And so that has really helped. And then that has actually led to the increased need as well. So a lot of these trends, I'm going to just kind of go over briefly to let you know what is happening in the field of psychology. Uh, since most of you that are watching this are in the field of education, um, I just want to kind of, again, give you a little bit of a idea of some of the 
the emerging trends that we're seeing in the field. So um, some things here, one of the things that we're seeing is psych psychology scientists, psychology researchers are reaching a wider audience. This is driven by a sense of purpose. Um, psychologists are finding new ways to get research and clinical advice to those who need it. So that's one of the things that we're seeing. We're seeing um, psychologists actually doing research outside of just mental health, outside of therapy. Um, people are using psychology research in all fields. We're seeing it just spread to all types of careers. Um, psychologists are taking aim at misinformation. So they're on a mission to fight conspiracy theories and other forms of dis and misinformation with science backed methods. So that's another thing that we are really seeing um, a trend in. Psychological research is becoming more inclusive. Psychologists are challenging traditional thinking about their research, including how it is conducted and who it includes. We are seeing a huge huge focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and inclusion. And we're seeing those rules expand. The world is looking for leadership around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And psychologists and the field of psychology are those that are stepping up to help these other um, fields understand why diversity, equity, inclusion is important and how to do it correctly because a lot of the current diversity, equity, inclusion trends are not actually meeting the goals um, because people have misinformation about what diversity, equity, inclusion actually means. Um, another thing that's really Im emerging is worker well-being. So workforce well-being is in high demand right now. Attitudes about employee mental health have dramatically shifted and psychologists are the people who are really leading the charge to help businesses prioritize employee well-being. So there are so many new jobs in the field of psychology that are out uh, that are outside of your common therapy and counselor. And some of them are consulting with businesses to help them understand the needs of their employees. Some additional things, there's efforts to improve children's mental health. That is really um, increasing. So research is focused on child and teen mental health. I just saw um, I just saw on the news this earlier this week about um, requests for additional government funding for um, mental health consultants, mental health programs in the schools because of teens and young adults. We're also seeing partnerships um, accelerating progress. So again, psychologists and other jobs in the field of psychology are now joining forces with other professions to tackle big societal problems, things from childhood mental health to um, other social violences, injustices, things like that. Suicide prevention is a huge, huge focus um, where we just developed the 988 lifeline. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, anybody can call 988 if they're struggling with thoughts of suicide and um, be connected to immediate help. Um, field of psychology is remaining on the forefront of suicide prevention serving as critical first responders, training non-psychologists to help meet the needs. I do a lot of um, suicide prevention training myself. So anyone whose organization's interested in that, you're welcome to contact me and I can always try to find out how to, um, how to bring some suicide prevention to your organization. One of the things that we're actually seeing is we're seeing psychology faculty exit academia. You're starting to see it's harder to find people to teach psychology. Students are feeling overwhelmed. Faculty are often feeling unsupported and overworked. And um, they're actually finding better job opportunities outside of teaching in higher education. So as I mentioned, as we're seeing the, the field broaden into these other fields, we're seeing you know psychologists going into HR, we're seeing them going into um, business management and consultation. And so they're leaving academia. So it's being, it's getting harder and harder to find people to teach these courses. Um, they're rebranding the field. Psychologists are expanding the one-to-one -one therapy approach to strengthen psychological health across entire 
populations where before it was often focused on individuals who were experiencing specific psychological disorders. Now we're recognizing that all humans need support and it's not just someone who has a mental health diagnosis, but um, a lot of, again, a lot of humans who are just trying to um, do life need neutral support and people to help them brainstorm and problem solve and, and work towards goals. So um, there's a few other ones on here. I'm not going to go into great detail. The last few here is, you know, we're really using the field of psychology and, and the people working within it to influence politics and policy. Um, it's going anywhere from therapy to we're using it in our, our therapy is going to tech. So we're seeing more people um, doing online mental health support, telehealth, mental health support. And that's really um, another reason people are leaving academia is because with a, a license, you can go in and make you know more money doing one-on-one -on -one therapy through telehealth and you don't have to leave your home. Um, you get to make your own schedule. So those kind of things are really changing the field and changing the types of jobs that are available. We're seeing it used in entertainment and sports. Most of our um, famous entertainers and our famous athletes are using mental health and counseling services <laughs> excuse me um, to improve their craft so using job or using life coaching counselors all kinds of different things to help them manage the stress that goes with performing at the level they're performing we are using this to help with burnout and stress public health messaging um, another one at the bottom here, this will be the last one I really point out, is recovery oriented. Recovery oriented is um, a mind frame that the field of psychology is moving towards, meaning they're they're moving away from a medical mindset and looking at recovery. Recovery oriented means that people can live well even when they struggle with mental health struggles, when they have symptoms associated with mental health struggles. And so this mind frame is, is going from a medical mind frame of you have symptoms, we need to get rid of them to you have symptoms. What would you like to do to live well with those symptoms? How would you like to manage those symptoms? And so that's really the focus um, going, you know, moving away from just looking at someone's diagnosis and looking at someone's goals, looking at someone's life, looking at their needs, their wants, their desires, and helping them reach those instead of just focusing on eliminating symptoms. Your current trends in sociology, this one is very interesting because it's really hard to determine what the trends are. Um, because as socio or as our culture changes, those of you who've been teaching sociology for a while have probably noticed that some of the information in our textbooks doesn't seem to match up with our current culture because we are in a cultural shift. And there are some things that used to be, you know, kind of hot topics in sociology that are really kind of just general topics in, in sociology now. Um, so looking at some of the things that sociologists are really focusing on is here, um, technology's growth and impact. How is technology impacting our culture and socialization? Um, changing social norms, as I just mentioned, we have a lot of differences in our social norms compared to 30 years ago. And so our research on those things is, is very, is in its infancy. So we don't have a lot of the information yet. And then continued social conflict, which they'll recognize is growing and continues to grow, has been growing and continues to grow a lot of, a lot of it because of that technology growth and the access we have to everybody. So Sociology is constantly evolving, which is one of the things that we really want, you know, are, are kind of focusing on. Not as many current trends, just because it is in such a um, state of unknown kind of at this time. Because the biggest question you can see here is what's next? We don't really know what's next. You know, this isn't like the weather that you can kind of predict, you know, yes, we can predict patterns of human behavior and we can go back in history and see what has happened in history but in sociology we really it's it's really hard to get ahead of 
the trends in sociology. We kind of have to wait for them to happen and then research the impact. So that's that's what we mean by what's next. Soci- sociologists are sitting here saying, um, I'm not really sure what's going on, you know, right here. So um, some of the other trends here is Um, There's some modern trends in educational management, and that is, you know, becoming an increasingly important field of study as educators are looking for new and innovative ways to improve the educational system. There's many other modern trends in sociology, but educational management is one of the most important ones at at the moment. So again, we're just looking at this as a a, a late, one of the latest developments that we're going to be working towards. We're looking at research methods as modern trends. There's been a move towards mixed methods research, which combines quantitative and qualitative data in order to get a more complete understanding of a research problem. Your qualitative research methods, such as interviews and focus groups, they're becoming more popular as researchers are seeking to understand the meanings that participants attach to their experiences. And quantitative methods, such as surveys and experiments, they're still widely used but there is increasing recognition of the need to use more sophisticated statistical methods in order to get the most accurate results. So what we're really saying here is we're questioning how research has been done in the past and looking at new ways to improve our methods. Um, Some of the social phenomena and modern trends that are happening is obviously there's many social phenomena that can be considered modern trends. Some of these include the increasing use of technology in all aspects of our lives, the globalization of um, economies and cultures, and the increasing diversity of populations. So those are all things that sociologists are just kind of waiting to study. Increasing the use of technology. Um, In terms of technology, we're seeing more and more people using it in everyday lives, as I just mentioned. This can be seen in the way that people are using technology to communicate with each other, to, um, I mean, honestly, even just to plan their day and to purchase items. Um, You know, we can, with our voice, add something to a calendar or ask, you know, ask a personal assistant to tell us what is on our calendar. We can do all of those different things. Um, The way that businesses are using technology to conduct their operations. For example, many people now communicate with friends and family with social media platforms. Businesses are using technology to conduct online transactions and to manage their operations. Those are all things that sociologists are interested in researching and studying. Globalization of economies and cultures. We are seeing a world where economies and cultures are increasingly interconnected. This can be seen in the way that people are traveling to different parts of the world for work or for leisure, as well as the way that businesses are operating in multiple countries. For example, many people now travel to different parts of the world for work, and businesses are increasingly operating in multiple countries. The last few on here, increasing diversity of populations. We're seeing a world where populations are increasingly diverse. This can be seen in the way that people are interacting with people from different cultures, as well as the way that businesses are catering to diverse populations more so than they ever have in the past. For example, many people now interact with people from different cultures, um, businesses that are offering products and services that cater to their needs. And again, these are just a few of your your modern trends in sociology. Last one on, on here is the impact of modern trends on social life. It's now more than ever that sociology has become an important tool in understanding social life. Modern trends have brought about various changes in the way we live and interact with others. And in order to keep up with these changes, it's important for sociologists to understand the impact of modern trends on social life. So I know these are just, again, I want to just kind of point out what the fields are looking at so that you are aware of, um, you know, kind of what they're hoping to do and maybe what they don't know. So again, sociologists, it's a little bit more up in the air. We're we're waiting for trends so that we can research them to see how they're impacting, um, which makes a a little bit of a delay. And and usually usually by the time we are researching and getting information, um, that cultural shift has already occurred. So it'll be interesting to see how, you know, the last 10 to 15 years with social media and the internet have, have truly impacted Um, the world that we're living in. So as I mentioned, um, there's some resources here for you, and this is going to be what ends uh, this little bit of the presentation. I do apologize. My 
um, my voice. I, I've been fighting, fighting something for, for a few weeks now. Uh, and it's just lingering around here. So as I mentioned, both the American Sociological Association and the American Psychological Association has information for you. You can find some of the stuff on trends. You can see, find the resources here. So I put the links on here for you. Um, the ones here in the middle that say APA pre-college, that is for high school teachers teaching um, psychology uh, as people prepare to go to go to college. So it's great for those of us teaching introductory psychology. Um, and I just wanted to make sure you have those resources. Some of, like I said, some of the things are free. Some of them, they ask for um, a membership, but I just wanted you to have that. So as I mentioned, we're not doing questions here since there's no one on. Um, but if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. My um, email is, is jpeacock at penhighlands.edu. You're also welcome to reach out to any of your other connections here at the community college. Um, thanks so much for your interest and willingness to teach these topics in the high school environment. I know that that has its own challenges and barriers that teaching in the college environment doesn't. Um, so again, I, I appreciate that. And we're here if you need us. All right, thanks.